My dogs don't bite, just ignore them. So. I am Diana England, and A Home for Spot is a nonprofit animal rescue. We. What do we do? There they come! A Home for Spot is a nonprofit group of dog lovers whose mission is to rescue, provide sanctuary, and ultimately to rehome abandoned, stray, and neglected dogs. Hey, they, ha they have another cattle dog. We get our dogs at our local shelter, the ones that they're gonna put to sleep for various reasons. Could be anything from broken toenail, not walking on a leash, not walking up to the front of the cage, broken leg, and so on and so forth. Where are you going? All dogs rescued by a home for spot are housed in foster homes where they are given love, attention, and any medical needs that may be required. We don't discriminate on any breed whatsoever. If we have the availability and the money and the help, we, we pull the dogs. All dogs rescued by Home for Spot are evaluated for personality and temperament. This helps them to be placed in homes that are well suited to their needs and the needs of their future owners. He's a good boy. We're only going to do this for a minute because see you're already breathing heavy. My name is Desiree and I'm with the Home for Spot Animal Rescue. A Home for Spot is comprised of many volunteers throughout Las Vegas and other outlining areas. Their objective is simple. They treat, socialize, and rehome dogs with new owners and fosters that they closely evaluate, making sure each dog continues to thrive in their new home. I grew up doing this. Um, I lived in the middle of nowhere in the country in Indiana, and we rescued dogs my whole childhood until we came out here. And um, my earliest memories are running through packs of dogs in the middle of the fields and everything and playing and helping take care of them and learning about what that life was like. And then when I came out here, it was something I wanted to continue. Um, I found a great passion for it and it really um, helped me get through a lot in my life and become who I am. And giving back is something I always wanted to do and I worked and worked and worked until I could get a full-time job in rescue, which is not always easy, but I love it. and. It's really, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a really hard ride, but it's been a great ride too. The last few years have been extremely hard for charities like A Home for Spot. One of the highest priority problems for animal rescues is a lack of public awareness both in how to handle their pets to prevent overpopulation and in the valuable services rescues provide in placing animals in good homes. I was a manicurist for like 35 years. So when I turned 50, I uh, decided I needed to do something different. So I quit my job and decided I was going to do this. I had $800 in the bank. <laughs> I know it's crazy, right? $800, oh, well, I can pay the rent now. I don't have a car payment, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is how you think, and I would do nails on the side. So I was sitting there talking to one of my friends one day um, as I was doing her nails. She's like, well, what do you want to do? I'm like, well, if I could do anything in the whole world, I'd like to do dogs, but you know, it takes some money, you know, and you know, don't have that. And the next apartment she came in, she handed me a lot of money. And she says, okay, so what's your first, what's your first rescue gonna be? Well, shortly after that, a friend of mine named Kathy called me. She was living in Mexico. And she says, there are these two uh, uh, Dobermans that were in small cages and that they were trying to sell. So she begged me to get them. So I sent her money to pay for the dogs to get released from there. Uh, she got all their shots up to date and we met halfway. It was my friend Tommy and I. So we drove down, met halfway in California, and then we have these two Dobermans in our car. We don't know what the hell we <laughs> gotta do. <laughs> we have no idea what we're gonna do. Where are they gonna go? You know, we don't know anybody. We don't know anybody in the dog world. We know nothing. We just know we like dogs. So I used to um, work with different rescues and would post stuff online, use social media to network dogs. And uh, I saw a posting Diana had for a dog that needed help and reached out to her and her and I met in a parking lot 
across town at an animal hospital and had a conversation and I ended up taking a dog home that day basically for her. And that was five years ago we started our journey together. So Tommy says, well, in his garage, he had, he had uh, a kennel and everything set up, a really nice kennel. They have an air conditioned garage, blah, blah, blah. And then he had a side yard. And a lot of those HOAs, you know, you hear these puppies barking and things like that, you know, it, it causes problems. So we met this lady named Joan. She had Noah's Ark Rescue out in Sandy Valley. So she had this cute little house out there. She had kennels out there and these were all, the majority of dogs lived outside, but they were taken care of. No fencing. They figured, she figured the way she looked at it is if they want to stay, they'll stay. And most of them did. And she was rough around the edges, boy. She, when you do this as long as we do it, you'll understand why you get rough around the edges, you know, like police officers, you know, because they have to deal with so much garbage every day. We brought him out there and she said that she would take him. And from there on, I mentored under her for about a year. The good, the bad, the ugly. That's how that all started. We had no idea what we were going to do. So a dog shelter is often operated independently. They have a stationary building with kennels and runs and a full facility with everything that they need. It's sort of self-contained. A dog rescue often, or a rescue in general, um, are usually foster-based, meaning we get as many animals into actual homes as we can. Um, and then sometimes what is left over is your medical dogs and, or dogs that cannot be placed right away into a home. So they then will be in, in boarding or whatever training, whatever that may be, a vet's office, until they're ready to be put into a foster home. So I would say the, the biggest difference for us is that we try right away to get as many animals as we can into homes. Oh, we work out of our homes. Well, my office is in my, I have my office illegally in my home. And then like we get people that donate like, this is going up to a foster salmon oil, immune builder, spray. I had five acres in Indiana. So the dogs got to run everywhere. It was amazing. It's very difficult to get that out here. Um, I find that the mindset here is a little bit different too. You come from a small town, Midwestern-y type of environment, and then you come out here in the big city, rescue is obviously done differently. The need is a lot more intense here. It's a lot more severe. It's a lot more emotional and unstable and difficult to deal with, quite frankly. Um, in a big city like this, you get a lot of different personalities, a lot of mentalities, and you don't get as much of the community working together as you'd like. Everybody sort of seems to think that they know a little bit better than everybody else. And in the end, the animals suffer for that. So we try to foster better relationships, quite frankly, with the community to try to improve that and pull together and work together when we can, offer assistance to other rescues and whatever it may be. I take behavioral dogs for other rescues. Diana does medical for other rescues. We try to uh, you know, scratch everybody's back in hopes that when we have a need that the favor will be returned because at the end of the day, we all need each other to do this job. Animal rescues are a huge asset to the communities they serve as well as the surrounding residents and of course to the animals. Unfortunately, their purpose and contributions to society are often misunderstood. Well, people think that they, they can just drop off their dog anytime to us for any reason. <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, for whatever reason, they're going on vacation here, have my dog, you know. Um, we're not like a local shelter. We just can't intake dogs, get your dogs fixed, do the shots. That's not how we work. We work through 90% of the time through the shelters. I think one of the biggest things I run into is that people thinking these animals are damaged in a way that won't allow them to live a normal life again. A lot of people forget that for animals, they let go of things so much easier than we do. So you can have a dog that may have been through some things or abandoned or whatever its story may be, but that dog will typically bounce back and be greater than ever with a little bit of effort. Um, and people often forget that. They worry, worry about where these dogs come from, their backgrounds, what they may have been through. And they live with the assumption that, that all of these dogs could be potentially dangerous. And it's not necessarily the case. I'm Kirk Richards, and I'm a dog trainer for a Home for a Spot. I currently um, take care of the, the big dogs that they have. Um, there's about seven of them that they have pulled from uh, the Animal Foundation that uh, I kind of work with right now. 
got into it, um, I had a heart attack when I was 50 years old. I was FedEx uh, courier driver for 25 years. Yeah, so I had to run into dogs all the time. <laughs> so I had a lot of trees that I took with me when I, when I did my route. My way of getting back into getting my, my, my breath up, my, my stamina back up, I, my wife suggested, hey, why don't you go walk dogs at the shelter? <laughs> so that's kind of how I got started in, in working there and, and working with the dogs and seeing how the dogs reacted to me and how I was able to, to make change in those dogs during that period of time kind of just led me on the path of dog training. In rescue, a lot of us have a very specific breed experience. Some of us may have done 25 years in bulldogs. Some of us have many years of wiener dog experience or whatever it may be. We find that often we'll get these dogs from the shelter, take them to the vet, get them vetted. And because there's often a lack of real breed knowledge specifically for these dogs, we will catch things that aren't ca caught by the veterinarians. Skin conditions, um, infected ears, the random little things that um, are specific to certain breeds. A lot of bully breeds have significant sk skin issues. Um, a lot of dachshunds, one in five dachshunds can have a back disease, IVDD. And we use that to guide us when we're doing adoptions. There's a lot of breeds I will not allow to be adopted to anyone who doesn't have breed specific experience. Shepherds, bully breeds, dachshunds, anything with a behavior issue, a quirk, a medical, something that I think people are really gonna need to understand to have at home, I won't allow them to adopt without prior experience in that because it's not good for the dog or for them unless they have a real willingness to study and learn and figure it out because we all start from somewhere. But they have to really be on board for that because some of these things can be more difficult than others to deal with. Bully breed skin issues can often last a lifetime. I've spent thousands on my own working on diet and skin and ears and all kinds of things to get her skin at a healthy place. Definitely like them all. Um, I personally own a Mastiff Amstaff mix, which is a lot of people want to say pit bull, but they're not. Um, I have a little Frenchie, so I go from big to small, and and I recently acquired a German Shepherd. So it's it's I'm not necessarily uh, picky about who I who I help. <laughs> well, there's not enough room because there's so many rescues if it wasn't for us the amount of dogs that would die would be like in the 20,000s i take i think last year i think i did it over like 1019 but with all the rescues that pull these dogs these dogs would be dead if it wasn't for us because the local shelters they only have so much room there's only so much liability and if it doesn't fit within that confined program that they have themselves in, it goes to rescue only. I got reached out to by a person, another volunteer that um, volunteers for a home for spot. Um, Diana, I guess, was reaching out to see if there was any trainers available that could help her at the time. So um, this person contacted me, I contacted uh, Diana, and that's kind of how our relationship started. So this is before I got my uh, 501, my nonprofit status, and again, didn't have very much money. And so I would get my family to go adopt these dogs with a senior rate. <laughs> so I get $50 off. And then I would find a family and adopt it to it. So they were already fixed, up to date on shops and chips. So that's how I started until I could save enough money to keep not have to ask anybody or, you know, and I would then go get another dog, find a home, go get another dog, find a home. And we start getting dogs. And then I met somebody named uh, Mandy Dawson. She was already in the rescue world before me and already working with another rescue, but decided it was time just to make a change. So she came on a board with me and I just kind of had to follow her lead, you know? And then it just went on from there. 
foster homes are so important because that's the first stop before the animal can go and be adopted by a family. It's where we learn, are they potty trained? Do they like if you're getting in their food? Um, do they not want to eat certain things? Do they not like other dogs or small humans or big humans or whatever it may be? That allows us to get a better picture of them so that when they're headed out and they're ready to be adopted, we have a whole picture of what they're gonna look like in the home. And I remember there was this one hoarding situation. It was, I think it was one of the commissioners rented out a house to some guy and the guy was end up being a hoarder. So there was like 36 chihuahuas there. And at that time, this is when they were killing way more dogs than they are now. You had four to six hours to make a decision whether those dogs were gonna stay alive or not. And Mandy and I must have been on the phone for four hours back and forth, networking, 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 networking. And I remember my daughter walked up, I could cry. <laughs> and she says, oh my God, mom, this is what you do. Oh my God, mom, I can't believe what you just did, you know? Cause we, in that short time, I don't remember it was four or six hours, we got all those dogs into foster homes. All of them and it's such a high and so gratifying that it pushes you to want to do more a foster is a person that opens up their home and their heart to an animal whether it's an hour for they take them out of the shelter for lunch and we have a special program for that or there's somebody who invites a dog into their home for a day or a week or however Absolutely. long it may be to get to know them, to give them shelter, food, um, and give them a place to, to decompress from their shelter life and whatever it is that they've been through until they're ready for adoption. And the fosters will often keep them through adoptions and take them home if they haven't been adopted and bring them back the next week. They take them to vet visits. They often will take them to um, our socialization play groups and things like that. Our really good foster will help the animal in their home learn along the way so that by the time they are adopted, they're better than they were when the foster got them. None of the foster parents are paid. However, a Home for Spot does provide food and basic care items for the dogs. It's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, you know, and you have to engage and you have to, you have to, it's not where you just go sit them in your yard. For a foster, I'm looking for somebody who will put a little effort into getting to know the animal. So as they get up and feed their dog over here, they feed our dog, they walk our dog, they love our dog. We have found that everyone from young people in college to the elderly like to foster dogs. Some don't always have the ability to take them full time. Maybe it's where they live or they're living with someone with allergies. And that's where we get people who come and visit us. They take a dog out of the shelter. They go hiking for a little bit. They go to the park for a walk. They go have lunch together and they bring them back. All kinds of things. It uh, A lot of teachers during the summertime will open up their homes. We find people with jobs like that with periods of time that they're off are very likely to foster dogs when they have the ability and other animals. Oh, I like him to be a lot like me. No. <laughs> um, what I look for is like when I'm doing an adoption event or something, I, I try to look at their lifestyle. So this is just an example. All right, so say husband and wife, they work 15 hours a day, but they want this little 14-week-old puppy. Well, in my opinion, there's no reason for them, them to have that puppy. So I would try to match them with a dog that doesn't need as much care, right? Or even try to talk them into getting two so they keep each other company. Because puppies need a lot of attention in the very beginning, a lot. So just like children. A home for Spot is in absolutely no hurry to ever place their dogs. In fact, they believe that finding the right fit for all parties concerned might take more than just a meet and greet and a home check. Because of this, their return rate is extremely lower than other establishments such as kill shelters. Um, what One thing that we have done that's a little bit different than other rescues are doing right now is that I developed a program um, that specifically goes towards those people who cannot do it full time but still want to make a difference and want to do something for the animals. We don't all have the ability to take home a dog if we have three at home or whatever the case may be or a child with allergies or something but maybe you just miss hanging out with a dog. You grew up with dogs, you always had them around and now you want to be one. one but 
people don't always know where to start with that. So we've tried to get the word out there that there's all kinds of opportunities for you to come foster. We are going to do a home check for a puppy that we are adopting out. And so and there are things that I look for. I want to see how clean your backyard is. If you have other dogs, I want to make sure you pick up after the, your dog and that my dog that's coming into your home is not walking in their stuff. Um, if there's toys laying around, um, wires hanging out, anything that could possibly hurt the dog is what I look for. He's the most docile, sweet, loving dog. He just, he's my lap baby. It's okay, bud. I get it. Here. We will make sure that he stays healthy and he's protected inside until All right. he's good to go. Fostering doesn't just mean one thing, it can mean many things. We start with social media advertising. That seems to be a really big um, part of what happens nowadays. So we do utilize social media quite a bit. I develop programs, we develop programs to um, target and campaigns to target towards getting those people to come in. Most recently, it was the temporary foster program, um, but we're always targeting towards full-time fosters as well because the need is so very great. Because A Home for Spot is a non-for-profit, they rely on fundraising and charity donations to help with their biggest expense, medical. Typically, their medical costs run anywhere from $1,500 up to $4,000 a month. They provide all the shots, microchip, and spray and neuter, plus any additional treatments needed. Their typical adoption fees range from $150 to upwards of $600. This really just depends on the dog's medical needs, the age of the dog, the training needed, and of course the breed of the dog. So we do a lot of networking on Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, all those social media groups, and um, we you know, show pictures of dogs, we need fosters for these dogs. We try to explain to them a little bit why, because they progress a hundred times faster than being in boarding, you know. Boarding is good for, you know, a few days and learning about the dog and then getting it into the proper foster. Um, but a lot of dogs don't succeed in there. They don't. It's, it's hard. Um, it's, it's all that nervous energy going on. They're looking for their family. They see all these strangers. It, it, it's hard. So when these people open up their home, they take a dog of ours and they treat it like their own until the day we get it adopted. All the time we're out there, we talk to people. Um, I try to hold play groups at our facility where people could come out, kind of see what things are about. We get our volunteers involved, the ones who come and just walk a dog or hang out. We talk to them about fostering, explain to them what it's like, how easy it can be, how rewarding it can be, and try to ease them into it a little bit when possible. A Home for Spot provides training and medical care to dogs and education to the public. Their training doesn't just involve the dogs, it also helps the humans associated with the dogs. Their, their willingness to, to uh, educate the community as to um, adopting what it takes to own a dog, a lot of times that's the reason why we get dogs into our rescue is because people don't understand how to handle them. So they get to their breaking point, oh, I just need to surrender this dog and I need to give it up. It's the family dynamic has changed, so. If they can help an owner find a solution to help with their problems, and it's in the best interest for the pet to stay with the owner, then they'll work closely with these individuals to formulate plans to achieve this. Hey, Lily, high five. Thank you. So the majority of our dogs are from the Animal Foundation, which is a, our local shelter, who is going no kill. This dog would have been adopted out a billion times if it wasn't for Tater. There's a list. Mandy pulls the dogs from the list. I can't look at them. If I see it, I have to pull it. It doesn't matter what's behind it, what figure's behind it, nothing. It. So I, I don't go on there anymore. I used to have to do it, but I don't do it anymore. And uh, she takes care of all that. And then uh, depending on who's working where that day, they'll go and we go to the Animal Foundation. Um, I call up the coordinators. They uh, say, hey, I'm here. And they, they bring my dogs out to me. I sign papers, release papers, because usually I have to sign a waiver because they could either be, if they lunge at you, if they look cross-eyed at you, if they won't go to the front of the cage, whatever you can possibly think of is a criteria for them not to take them. 
so then we get them. You guys already gave me these answers before, but I don't know. I just didn't remember. I re didn't write it down. So, uh, um, Michelle's eight puppies, um, one named um, Cheesecake. You can look it up that way. What date is that uh, next shot due? Uh, they go into boarding uh, for a day or two uh, just to see so we can figure out what the dog's deal really is. And then we put them into foster homes. And then when they, we can get a dogs into foster homes, that's really when we can tell so much more of what's going on with the dog and figure out how to, that we need to work with it. But because it's so, I mean, it's hot, it's hot, but it's a uh, cloud coverage. It's only 126. <laughs> the challenge is trying to figure out, first and foremost, why they got brought back. Um, I don't necessarily want to know their whole backstory as to why they were rescued or why they were given up or, you know, I just assess the dog. Okay, this is what the dog's doing. He's pulling too much on the leash. They probably couldn't walk him. He gets a little nippy or aggressive at other dogs. So that's one thing I've got to work on. So I just start building structure back into the dog, creating them to be actually dog-like as opposed to those behaviors that they portray. You don't won't know this either. There's no way of knowing that. Sometimes we don't have those dogs with that. Another thing too is a lot of times the dogs will get kennel cough. It's like, you know, like how you've been working, 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 and then you go like, oh my God, this weekend, I cannot wait just to relax and have a good time and be with my friends. And then all of a sudden you get sick. It's kind of like the same thing with dogs. The same thing happens. <laughs> Well, you definitely uh, don't want to give it eye contact because a lot of times dogs will take that as a challenge and, and want to test you. <laughs> so I just kind of let them roam around me if they can, get my scent, get my sniffs. I'll, I'll usually go with a walk with the people because they're the ones that are able to handle it. And I'll ask them to hand me the leash. And then after that, it's pretty much me controlling the dog at that point. According to the ASPCA, 34% of dogs are purchased from breeders, while only 23% are obtained from animal shelters. This is why so often rescues and animal shelters will hold charity events and showcase days. Not only does this encourage people to adopt an animal, but it also raises public awareness of the great humane work these societies do. So then we have adoption events at uh, PetSmart. Every single weekend, doesn't matter when it is, we're always there. They'll come in, we try to match a dog to your lifestyle. So for example, if you want this four month old puppy and you work 15 hours a day, well, what's the point? So we try to work on that with them and try to help them understand that. If we feel good about it, we do, uh, a lot of paperwork. <laughs> a lot of a lot of paperwork. I just want to know. <laughs> Running an animal rescue is difficult. You have to balance the desire to help as many animals as you can against the need to run profitably in order to keep your doors open. Compounding this issue is that there is little federal or subsidized funding available for rescues meaning many of the nonprofits have to make hard decisions in how many animals they can help, how much staff they can maintain, and how effective they can be. Yeah, you have to have a passion for it, and you have to have a drive. I have a huge drive. I'm kind of like type A. Most of the people in this industry are kind of like that. I wouldn't say I'm a workaholic, but I work a lot, because who's going to do it? I have to wear a hundred hats. I wish I could just wear one hat and do it the best, <laughs> but I can't. And there's never gonna be enough people. There's not enough people to help. Because if you do have enough people, then you say to yourself, you know what, we're gonna do this. We're gonna do that. We're gonna go here, you know. We're gonna start an outreach program because you're just, it feels so good to, to give and, and to do and accomplish and, you know, have that gratification that you get from it. You know, my favorite one, my, this is my most favorite stories and I'll probably cry because I always do. I would have to go in, if one of our dogs got out from a foster home, I would have to go into um, admissions and I'd have to get our dog back. And I'm sitting in there 
And there was this whole Spanish family all crying. They're crying and crying. And I'm like, and they're holding this dog. And I'm like, what is wrong? <laughs> I was like, this is in my business. And they're like, well, you know, our dog got hit by a car and uh, we don't have any money to get it uh, better. And we thought if we brought him here, that the that the, our, the local shelter would do it. And they informed us that they don't, but they would gladly euthanize the dog for them. And I'm like, okay, give me a minute. So I go call the vet and I'm like, hey, this is a story. What do you think we can do? And he's like, yeah, just bring it in. So I like, I get to go over there and tell them that your dog's not dying today. Oh my God, like, and I, I've been fortunate enough to do that a lot. You know, a lot of times to pay their bill like that. It's like the best feeling in the whole wide world. Back there is probably, I don't know, 60 dogs. Sounds pretty quiet right now though. G.I. Joe, I named him. He's, you know, a massive, anything massive I'm crazy about. Yeah. Best dog ever, polite. His worst trait was pulling on a leash, that's it. And we were at an adoption event and He's a family coming back for the second time to uh, meet. First meeting, fantastic. Second meeting started off good and the dog jumped straight up and bit the, the teenager here. And that's so out of character, like so out of character. We had the dog for months. We've done everything with this dog. I mean, I, I you know, everything, whatever you can think of. So anyhow, we did all these tests and everything. And yes, he's having seizures and there's nothing that pinpoint like a tumor behind something or pushing on something. So he's on meds. He's been on meds for the last six months. Nothing, no, no nothing. Because in retrospect, when we learned about what a focal seizure was, we thought, oh, that's what he was doing. We thought he would, when he was sitting stare at a wall, we thought he was depressed. Little did we know, right? A home for Spot currently operates at a thrift store where people can donate slightly used items which are then spruced up, reconditioned, and resold to the public which in return gives them the ability to help more dogs. Okay, so we bought this building about a year and two months ago and we were going to do like a doggy daycare for a home for Spot dogs. The whole idea was for them to live here, train here. 24 seven, right? So they would only be in their kennels when they were eating or sleeping. There would always be activities. We were gonna do home-like uh, little vignettes all over to be able to train them on a consistent basis. Here's your ball. We have a half acre in the back of the store here. That's beautiful. It's just clean, it's perfect. So we were doing obstacle courses and we were going to build five to eight big dog uh, kennels, air conditioning, of course, in Las Vegas. When I originally decided to do this, I went down to North Las Vegas zoning, told them what we had planned, told them what I wanted to do, and they said, sure, no problem. You need to do this, this, and this step, but you, it, it's not a problem. So got the building, paid for it, got that taken care of, getting in my car, going ready to submit our paperwork, and they said, no, does that make any sense? Like we saved over a thousand dogs last year in homes, a thousand dogs. If it wasn't for the rescues in Las Vegas that step up and go to the Animal Foundation and pull those dogs, their numbers would be so high on the euthanasia list, it, it, it would be crazy. I mean, I understand that we have to follow procedure, we have to follow law, and I'm like totally cool with that. But it's like animal control, we met with animal control, they said we have no problem with you being over there, Diana. As long as you do the things that you say you're gonna do, we have no problem you being there. But zoning said no, and we're gonna continue to fight it. But in the meantime, you can't have a building sitting here doing nothing. You have to do something. But this store does well, this store does well. I take money at the end of the month to put it into medical and it helps me with another store I have on the other side of town. Approximately 6.5 million animals enter U.S. animal shelters nationwide every year, 
This absolutely staggering number of animals means that as much as they want to find good homes for each, it can be quite challenging to do so. We just took in, I think it was like 46 puppies from a hoarder and they were all parvo exposed. So the whole community, all the rescues jumped in to take these dogs and to pay for everything. We paid for everything. Community helped pay for those too, you know? And everybody's full, everybody's so full, but everybody went above and beyond. We took 10, one passed away, and the other ones are thriving. So they're ready to go, they're, they'll, they'll get adopted. We're putting the last two on the uh, website this weekend. And it was a good save. You should see them. They're the cutest little things you ever seen. They're like, they're tiny. Like when I got them, they were one and a half pounds. I don't think people go like, oh, I'm gonna hoard these animals. I think they start off thinking they want to help. And then just like their compulsion with other things, it gets, and they feel protected and it's their family and it's this and it's that. And, but in the meantime, what they live in and the, you know, that's all animal control stuff. Yeah. I think, they do the best that they can. I believe they're understaffed, you know, just like everybody else. And they can only do so much. I believe if penalties were a lot higher, you know, I've heard, and I don't know for fact that, you know, the fines are so minimal, they're minimal. And if I'm correct, animals are not they're, look, they're not looked as life, they're looked at as property. We have a, a, a task force here, and we recently had something happen where we adopted out a dog uh, to somebody, and uh, he beat the shit out of it and threw it in the dumpster when it was still alive. Yeah. So that's a um, something that's going on, you know. And it's sad, and, and the sad thing is, you know, things people get in there and try to spin it when they don't even know what was really going on. It's, it's a really difficult, difficult business to be in. I work like this, you know, how the horse has the blinders. That's how I work. I don't look over here, I don't look over here, I don't hear any of this stuff. I just keep going. Because it wears you down so emotionally that it's, if you can't take that kind of stuff, you know, as it, it, you know, it can really, break your life down. It's called compassion fatigue, and it's a very serious problem. And all of us at one point or another who work in this full time have experienced some of that. Whether you go home and you have to sleep for nine hours, which has happened to me, or you have days where you absolutely just have to shut off your phone and you can't deal with it anymore for a little while. We deal at the end of the day with death and emotion and abandonment and abuse and medical and, and all kinds of things. And there are highs and there are lows all day long. In one day, you can see two long-term dogs go into homes and be in tears over that and happiness and have to euthanize another dog who never had a chance at life. So what we do is often complex and it can be a little whiplashy emotionally. It's like being bipolar when you're not, but the emotions can be difficult. And if you don't practice self-care, it can be a real problem. There's a lot of people in this industry who have hurt themselves or thought about hurting themselves because of the lack of, of understanding about what we do, the lack of resources for help for people to understand and to go to someone and say, I, I can't cope right now, I need help with that. Um, it is, it's a pretty big problem. When at the end of the day, as most of us just want to save the dog. I went to the Animal Foundation about a year and a half ago and there was a dog named Roscoe and he had skin so bad that he looked like an elephant instead of a dog. His hair was all missing, um, his skin was leathery, he wouldn't walk, he wouldn't eat, he, nothing. He was in terrible shape. I had to pick him up and carry him out of the shelter and into my car. We had to get him into a veterinary for about six weeks, I believe. He was there recovering. His hair started growing back bit by bit, um, quite a bit of medical involved. But in about two months, his hair had grown back. He had become an entirely different dog. He went from looking like a baby elephant to a beautiful black shepherd who was then adopted by a family where he has been this whole time living his life and enjoying things and being an actual dog again. I can tell you about this initiated pit bull that we got that was 
This dog lived at the vet for about a month. Everybody loved the dog. Everybody fell in love with the dog. And we had someone step up and said, you know what, we'll foster the dog for, for you guys. And they did. And if you can see the dog now, how amazing it looks. Because it to me, it looks like it's part French Mastiff Pitbull. Same coloring, same jaws. Once it got its body built back up, like those are like my favorite stories. Some of the things that we do occasionally are to pull a dog from the rescue list who doesn't have a chance at life, illness, whatever it may be. We've pulled cancer dogs. We had one a while back that had a tumor, a very large tumor on the jaw. It wasn't going to make it, but we didn't want it to die in the shelter. So we took him and gave him a day out and feeding him and loving him and doing what we could. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, these are the hard decisions that had to be made in rescue and it was his time. Just depending on it, but if we do get a place like we did last time, if we don't use our facility that we bought for a place, you know, where the thrift store is, that if we get a building, you know, 2,500 square feet or more, that I'm gonna have those portable walls put in that you can move around. So when you're taking dogs out to go for walks or do exercise programs or whatever the case may be, they don't have to walk down one row of dogs going crazy at each other. You have about 30 and you submerse them into our program, whatever program that may be. So we make a better dog, you know, and we turn them over. And then, then you know, our thing is, you adopt a dog from us, we want you coming back and taking classes from us. I like big dogs. I have five big dogs. I have a, a, master, a French Mastiff Pit Bull, uh, about 110 pounds, and I have um, a French Mastiff um, uh, Labrador, and then I have a, a Boxer Pit Bird Dog, and then I have a Boxer, and then I have, this one was supposed to be um, a Mastiff, and if you would have seen the picture of him as a puppy, because he was a big chunky puppy, it was the exact picture in the book of what a bull Mastiff would be looking like as a puppy, but it's short like a beagle. <laughs> so. My role as, as one of the trainers for the rescue is to uh, bring balance back into the dogs. Um, they walk next to you like they're supposed to. They don't pull when they walk. They wait at the door to exit before, you know, going. Um, they come back in the door and wait. So the five, you know, the, like the seven steps, sit, stay, down, come, off, heal, and no, are kind of the basics of what I cover in the rescue in a very short period of time because I don't know how long the dogs are actually going to be there. So I have to impart as much as I can of those seven steps to ensure that uh, they're gonna be well-rounded and, and get their forever home. There's so many different things that you can do. It's awesome um, with dogs to pique their interest. I have a dog treadmill, I dog treadmill. So if I can't get the dogs out, and my, my real big Mastiff, his name is Pink Floyd. Like I said, so here's my treadmill and it has wrought iron, you know, fencing on the side. And so I sit here, I, I, I put a, a harness on him and then put the leash on him. I just sit here and I kind of like do phone work. So he, he walks up and he moves my hands and he puts his head right here and he just walks for 20 minutes with his head here. It doesn't take too long. Um, I can probably tell within 15, 20 minutes, you know, exactly kind of what I'm dealing with. Um, is it fear-based? Is it um, true aggression, which very rarely is it true aggression. It's usually almost always fear-based aggression as opposed to an, an alpha type dog being aggressive. But uh, um, that's pretty much what you deal with. My sister fosters uh, two chihuahuas for me, so she'll, I'll have them there if she has a really long day. And they'll jump on the treadmill with them. They love it, they love, they love it, honestly. It's, it's the cutest thing, you know, it's fun. No chemicals in these, backpacks. What I'm gathering is there's absolutely no structure in the house and 
too many people coming in and out. So what Diana wants to do is, is bring knowledge to the public, and that's kind of what we're starting up with social, socialization classes. Some of the adopters that adopt dogs from us are going to have to start now going through some classes with me so I can help teach them they're pack animals. There's a structure, there's an order as to how they are to act, how they eat, how they sleep, where they sleep. Do they interact with these dogs or not these dogs? So it's, it's a, a, a truly an animal environment and us as humans have to look at this as they're still animals, they're not humans. With all the rescues that pull these dogs, these dogs would be dead if it wasn't for us. Because the local shelters, they only have so much room, there's only so much liability, and if it doesn't fit within that confined program that they have themselves in, it goes to rescue only. For the first time, we're hearing from the family of a woman who has devoted her life to saving dogs. Over the weekend, though, one of those dogs attacked her and two others at the rescue organization. So, two and a half years ago, we had a shelter downtown. It was a dog that I met and brought into the shelter. It was, I think, late in the afternoon. We were all cleaning. Friday night, the city of Las Vegas says a pit bull mix in the rescue's care mauled her and two volunteers. Um, one of the trainers was bringing one dog around through the back up to the one side after treadmilling it and something happened between then and there. I don't know. I was out cleaning. I hear screaming. I go run in. I see they're having a problem trying to get the dog into the kennel. I go lock the door where the other people were so nothing would happen to them. and. They try to get the dog into the kennel. Well, they did and they shut it, but they didn't lock the lock. So the dog got back out, started attacking everybody. I was the last one there. Everybody else got out into a safe area. And so then I got attacked. It's very, very emotional. Yeah. The toughest thing was calling my parents and having to get them down separately. So I was in the hospital, I don't know, seven, 10 days. I couldn't walk for over three months couldn't take a shower. I had these little um, skin backs on me, on my arm, on my leg. Um, that was pretty much a horror story. I was just sitting there praying that I get to see my kids <laughs> again. But um, she didn't stop me. Vicki England says her sister's recovery is looking very positive, as are the two other victims. She says they had to take Diana's phone away because she was trying to work from her hospital bed. Well, I, probably my stubbornness keeps me going, but, you know, I was hearing people were saying like, oh, so-and-so called and said they heard that you weren't going to do dog rescue anymore because you would be so traumatized or you couldn't walk or this or that. And I'm like, what? Like, that's, then they don't know me because that's not me. This is just a bump in the road. Diana will be back, her sister says, and more ready to work than ever. And, and it took me a minute to get back with the big dogs again, you know. It took me, I would say, you know, it took me about a month or so to g gain my confidence back up, but um, it, I, I, these things happen and I know that and I know, not that it's part of the business, but there are things that do happen. Are we more careful? Do I, did I learn more? Absolutely. Do I take every class I can to learn more? Absolutely. You know, hope it, it was an isolated incident. That's what I'm hoping for me and it doesn't happen to anybody else. You know, it, it, it's scary, it's scary. 90% of the issues that dogs have is human related, okay? The fixing the dog is the easiest part of dog training. <laughs> it's basically making them where they belong, which is a following creature. Teaching the humans is where it comes difficult. <laughs> So that when, with rescue, that's the stigma. It's, it's um, oh my God, they were in there because they bit somebody. They were in there because they're not good dogs. Um, that's not necessarily the fact. It's the fact that people didn't know how to <clears throat> treat a dog or what dogs, dogs a lot of times get treated like humans. We humanize the, 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 the dog, okay? 
dogs don't understand human emotion. Out of all the, the, the things that I deal with, it's, that is the most thing I deal with is people wanting to give affection to the dog as opposed to, and then it's not good affection. There's bad affection, there's good affection. So what you wanna do with a dog is treat the good behaviors with affection, the calmness with affection. When they're excited, you, if you, I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of people will, with smaller dogs, will pick their dog up when they get overly excited or overly aggressive towards, and they'll start petting them like this. What they're doing is they're locking their brain into that situation. And you're basically telling the dog, yes, please, please be this, this spazzed out. Please be this crazy. And, and people don't realize that. So that's kind of where my teaching the people kind of starts first. It's like, you got to stop humanizing the dogs. Nobody has any idea. Even people that work within the company don't have any idea. After I got hurt, and I couldn't do anything for a few months, people, you know, had to learn what I did, you know? I believe that there's a person for every single dog. We have adop adopted dogs out there where they had to be on medicine. It was like, I don't know, something like $250 a month on medicine for the rest of their life. And people step up to that. You just have to, you, you, you just have to, you know, you have to just keep trying. You have to keep trying. There's, there's always somebody out there. You could, if you love social media, just sharing everything that we do. That's huge, really huge. Especially if you have um, a lot of followers. Um, coming out to adoption events, working the adoption events, another big deal. If you're, if you're good and a big dog handler, huge for us because we don't have a lot of them. So all the big dogs at one time never get to go to an adoption event. We have to rotate them because there's not enough, I wanna say educated dog, big dog people. We have thrift stores. You can come volunteer at the thrift stores. Um, you could, um, we have dog walking. We have a lot of dog walkers where they come out uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and they walk our dogs. Sometimes we have so many people over there, they walk everybody else's dogs too that are there. <laughs> the whole building will be walked. Even if you're boarding as say, you're not a rescue, they'll walk their dogs too. So everybody gets out. Before you ever start your own rescue, you need to immerse yourself as much as possible. It is not an easy life and it's not for everybody. You really have to have a thick skin to do this and a capacity to not just be understanding, but to be flexible, to look and live inside the gray area a little bit because this is not a black and white issue. Um, you really need to make sure that you're prepared for the emotional complexities, the time away from your family, the effects it could have on you mentally, physically, the stuff that you have to go home and carry. There's a lot of joy in this too. And there's a lot of good and some days bring really amazing things that will carry you through the hard ones. There are definitely hard days too. I wouldn't recommend this to anybody who isn't prepared for that and willing to invest of themselves because truly at the end of the day, you, you have to have a passion for this or you're gonna burn out really quickly. I would tell them to go work with one for a year first before you decided. It's a really hard business. And if you don't have big shoulders, you will be torn apart. Definitely adopt and don't shop. That's so important. I mean, there's so many fantastic dogs out there that are just looking for homes uh, and all they need are people to give them the opportunity to, to, to be that. If you'd like to get involved with us in particular, you can start out at our website at www.ahomeforspot.com. There's a volunteer app there. There's a foster app there. As soon as you put in the information, it comes to me. We take a look at it. I call you up. We have a conversation about what it is you want to do and, and how you can help. And we move forward from there. Every rescue and shelter in this town needs help. It does not matter if you help ours. Every rescue needs help. Just going and helping any way you can is so important and it's so valued by all of us who do this work. What I would like to say is try to go support your, your grassroots dog rescuers because people have no idea what we do and the hours that we put in. I get up, get my kids off to school. 
I work, I pick them up, I come home, I cook dinner. I work till 10, 11 o'clock at night on dog stuff all the time. It never stops. I work seven days a week. It's a lot. But the community support is what helps us. I don't think they understand that a lot of us are not federally funded. We get grants, not a lot, but we get grants. Most of our money comes from the adoption of our dogs and our community. I happen to be lucky that I live in a great community and they're all dog lovers. But the majority of people do not know the expense. Like we spend $180,000, $190,000 a year on medical. And those are the ones that we pull from lead animal foundation that they're gonna kill. They put on the rescue only list. We take them, we clean them up, we get them homes. I truly believe that rescue is about spreading love. It sounds hooky or whatever, like a hippie, but what we do is we take those who have been abandoned, left behind, injured, whatever it may be, and we help them become dogs again. And then we help them match to families who need them as much as they need them. So we're putting love and goodness out into the world. And every time that happens, more comes. So every animal that gets adopted, another one gets to take it, its place and be saved. And that animal that comes in makes a space at the shelter and so on and so forth. It's such a butterfly effect that just the littlest bit of things that you could do, even if it's transporting a dog from the shelter to the vet's office for a rescue or offering to drop by with a bag of food or to take a dog a walk, all of those things make a huge difference in the lives of these animals who sit day in and day out wondering what's gonna to happen to them, where they're gonna go from here, and what the rest of their life is gonna be like. We help them take those steps and get to the rest of their life. And that's the beautiful thing about rescue is that we're here like a safety net to catch all of those animals and the people too, because quite frankly, there's a lot of people who need us as much as their animals do. Sometimes that may be people who need someone to help them keep their animal in the home because they can't afford the surgery that comes up. Diana is notorious for doing owner helps like that and not saying a word to anybody about what she's done, but helping an animal stay in the home because they couldn't afford the surgery to save its life or whatever may need to be done. There's a lot of parts of rescue that move all the time. It's never just what you see on the surface. There's so much more involved. And that's why everything that everyone does, big or small, plays such a vital role to how we operate and how we're able to save lives every day. They hate to turn any dog away and would love to save them all. Often, they'll help a family who simply can't afford medical treatment on a dog, but without donations, a home for spot won't be able to continue helping those in need. So any donations, whether it's $1 or $100, helps them to maintain their goal. So support your local rescues. Oh, so tomorrow um, my cousin and I are driving to Irvine, California because there was a lady, her and her son was down, I guess, visiting cousins. They had the dog out, no leash. They heard the dog heard some big loud noise, ran off, and then it was time for them to go home and they left the dog there. So Irvine, California called me, said, we have one of your dogs. Can you look up this microchip? So I looked it up and I gave them their number. And so she just strung them along and then she just quit talking to them. I'm gonna go down and get our dog back. Nope. And I'm bringing four more back. Cute, they're all cute. Cute small dogs. So what I was um, doing the other day when I was sitting down talking to somebody about why do our dogs seem so expensive, the general public just doesn't have a clue that we're not state funded and we're not federally funded. So when we have a dog come in and it needs to be spayed or neutered, three sets of shots in a chip, sometimes depending on the weight of the dog and what vet we have to use, we could be up to $250. Now, if it was in boarding for five days, now we're up to $300. If we don't recoup those costs, we cannot help anybody. 
So that's something I really would like the general public to know. That's when I was saying earlier in the program that um, if there was one thing that you could tell everybody and it was, it was uh, support your local rescue groups because we don't get those benefits that the other places do.